you like to name some of them? Uh, yes, if you recall that slide previously. Well, yeah, CMC this part. Yeah, yeah. CMCVD, SONCAM, uh, United Pledge, uh, the Yeah, sure. And, uh, the slide he wants, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let, me, uh, let me go back. There it is. So what we talked about is showing how we could have percentages anywhere from 20 to 33% based on requests. And one of the largest requests that we received on many different meetings was lower affordable ranges. People didn't want to see units at 120% AMI, 150% AMI, meaning someone making 130, 120, 130,000 a year could qualify for an affordable unit. They wanted to see units that qualified for people that were in the community that needed affordable housing. And so what we showed were these five options. And in large, most of the groups focus on option number two, which is the third one over with the yellow, the red, and the blue, which has all of its affordable units under 90% Most of them are 55%, several at 70% and 90% AMI. Uh, and altogether, this was roughly 20% of our units of the taller building. So the taller building has 300 or 299 units. So this equated to 60 uh, affordable units, all below 90% uh, AMI. Well, a personal social security in the city of Kidding to that situation, not all those nice places you build up there, you're going to see the pool of social security for what they uh, are. Uh, High property job, and that afford you a nice affordable building. So I was ready to speak up because I can't hear that. Oh, I said, it doesn't appear that anything that you have there represents the actual dynamics of what's going on here as far as people needing homes. Mm -hmm. they're, they're fitting the people who have already money, they're fitting people that can afford this richness. So that way, the people who's building this place get all their money back in a chunk. Right. But when it comes down to the people who actually need a home, there's nothing there. And I think two, uh, 24, 24 rooms or apartments in these places is hardly enough for the actual need that is here. Right. I, think that, I think there should be a balance act going on mm -hmm. where it's balanced, whereas you build this for the rich folk, right. and you don't, you don't cheapen it by building cheap buildings for the poor, but you build accordingly for the poor as well, mm -hmm. and both groups will benefit from it. I think that's uh, that's a sentiment that we agree with and we share. And, and what I'd like to reiterate is our building will have all of its affordable units in the same building, spread throughout the building with access to all the same amenities as the market rate units. And on the taller building, we would actually be building 60 of 300 units, would be affordable units on site. 60? 60. Okay, so, let's just ask that's a question. still hard for someone to get in. So you know? It, 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 is, it is hard in terms of availability. You have to apply for a lot of it. But all of our units, if anyone have, makes an income less than 90% of adjusted median income would qualify for those units. Same with myself, you know, um, I'm on, living on a disability, which is only giving me $985 a month. Mm -hmm. I'm only a one-person income. That ain't going to get me in there. I put my application in NEMA and some of these other ones, and um, they didn't even get back to me. Yeah, the, the lottery, unfortunately, is oversubscribed. There are not enough. Uh, affordable units that are being built to, uh, to for everyone that wants one of them, which is why we need to build more. Um, but unfortunately, we don't control that. Once the once an affordable unit gets built, um, it's handed over to the city, and they administer how uh, the lottery uh, selects well, someone that qualifies. Sure. Well, um, my question is, why don't you if you can and you want to build percentages? 
put in a, put a dollar amount on those three areas yeah. so people can understand more so how much money we're actually talk, talking about mm -hmm. for rent value um, the percentages don't uh, yeah understood there are those charts that i mentioned on the sf planning site they get very detailed what's that everybody has understood understood what, what we can do is we can provide the information to you is that possible and then you can disseminate it and then um uh, your We'll make sure we send it to you tomorrow. We'll send you all that information. I think it's very important information people yep. should know. What AMIs qualify for what and how much that actually translates into rent. Right. People need to know that. Yeah. So, yeah, we'll yeah. get that to you so you can have that. It's tough tomorrow. to put all that information on a slide that makes, makes sense. Um, if you could put it in the hard copy. Yeah, we'll get that to you guys. Okay. Yeah. Those people What's that? I'm one of those people who are not a computer. Sure, definitely. Uh, one more question, please. Yep. Will people on social, the people on social who had a, uh, uh, a housing value from Section 8 units live in developed buildings? There are no Section 8 units on this development. So. Okay, now that's another issue. Now, we already have enough places for people to live at. So, is, is there should be some consideration for people who, have, who, are, who are desirous to move into, into nice and level buildings and have those options. Who has those options might be able to get opportunity to live in one of these places uh, because after all it's the well, government to have to have anyway. Okay. Uh, uh, if somebody has a, a voucher, section eight voucher, they can move in to a VMR gun. Yes, that's a, so just yeah, so I, I missed getting to move in. That, so that is correct, that is correct. If you qualify for a voucher from uh, the uh, 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 there, there's a housing and uh, then you can move in there as I a have a section eight one. up what we we've learned through talking to the community groups is people don't care as much about units that are middle and upper middle income units that are 120 percent ami 150 percent ami the, the the request for it was for more deeper affordable units and that's the direction that we have gone and so from there we have begun to design our building um, in more detail and as you can see this 200 foot version 21 stories tall, has 299 rental units, of which 60 of them are uh, affordable. Uh, there is ground floor commercial along Mission Street, and as you can tell, it's tough from this rendering, it's a little blurry, but the exterior will be precast brick, so it will have an old brick look and feel to it. There will be a terrace on the 10th floor and a rooftop on the 21st floor few other views of it. This is looking from 8th Street on Mission towards 9th Street. This is at the corner of 9th Street, looking at it. You can see the Potter Hotel in the foreground, the building going up from there. This is a straight on view. And then we get to the ground level. The ground level has the uh, cream colored stone on the first two floors, a, a uh, uh, details at that level dividing before we go into uh, the brick. And we also have uh, some wrought iron metal Juliet balconies on the first couple floors. The goal of this is to bring what is a tall building down to scale to someone on the pedestrian level walking around. So really, the first four floors of the building is very unique to the rest of the building, just like this, the Potter Hotel next door is four stories. We're trying to bring the scale of a tall building into proportion to a shorter neighbor so that pedestrians walking around don't feel overwhelmed by a tall tower. Right, can you go back to the slide showing the other tall buildings in ours uh, kind of in a row? Yes. Uh, you just, there it is. 
Yeah, so those are the primary buildings. In the back, NEMA, I believe that's 12% affordable. Um, there's uh, the Trinity Towers, Angelos and Giacomo. I believe those are 12% affordable as well. Um, the Soma Grand, which we developed, we developed during 12% affordable as well. So with that taller version of the 1270 mission, it would be 20%. So compared to all these other tall buildings, we want much higher affordability. Yes? Um, are you uh, taking part in the affordable bonus program? No, we're not. So um, what's the limit on the height of the building here in the mission? I'm sorry, I can't believe of our site or across yeah, the bar? Yeah, just period. Because I was at one meeting and we were talking about airspace. And this is a, this is a different project. Though. Okay, but I'm just saying, is, right. is there a limit on how high building goes? The current the height, no, this is on Mission Street. Yeah. I know, Mission. Uh, no, on, yeah. Yeah, on Mission Street. So it's, uh, go back to the slide with the heights. Yep. Uh, no, the, the zoning. The zoning. Oh, yeah. Way back the Not the best slide from this distance. Right there, so it's 120. Oh, yeah. There's, there's, a, there's like a checkerboard of heights in this area. Right. Oh, but so the RSI right there is 120 feet. Uh -huh. We're 120. Right next to us is 200. Right next to us, which is right now just a one story building, is 150. You don't see it here, but Trinity yeah. is 240. Soma Grand, 240. Uh -huh. This bed building, 240. And you go one block this way, you've got several buildings, 200, and a 320 at NEMA. So you've got kind of a, a patchwork quilt of old heights right here. Okay. So what we are looking at in order to provide more affordable housing is to match the height of our adjacent neighbor, still being shorter than all of these buildings and these buildings over here. So I guess, and, 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 Interesting way, regardless of the zoning, you ask for conditional use to get the higher zoning, right? Uh, that's correct. Yeah. So it doesn't, even though you get the zoning part, uh, you can always ask for higher. Yeah. For conditional use. So for everybody that wants housing, write a letter of support saying we want more housing on this site that will meet our needs and uh, uh, the conditional use uh, to be uh, given to uh, given permission. So one, one. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Uh, one of the other, one of the other needs uh, in this uh, uh, social needs is to have teachers have places to live in the city. There's always been discussions of different things of uh, turning old school buildings into or school properties into housing for teachers, and it seems to just go nowhere. Now, Cal, uh, PRIG, uh, 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 they're, they're, a they're a retirement fund for, for uh, CalPERS. CalPERS is, like State of California Retirement? Yes. Uh, and would they be interested in funding some of these other projects to to house very necessary school teachers closer to where they work. I mean, I, I believe the CalPERS would always be interested in we, building We've actually we've been trying to work with the city to try to give preference to first responders, teachers, etc. but there's no law that provides for that right now. It's very complicated for housing rules. I do know there is uh, legislation in the works to try to take unused unified school district land mm -hmm and try to convert that into uh, housing for teachers. Yeah, I remember that was floated a few oh, years no. ago. Yeah. And it's just wasted. A lot yeah. of land is wasted. Just being yeah, wasted. right down on let's see, the Terrafell Parkside area, I remember there's one huge place, and they were talking about turning that into it. Yep. Into, you know, I think it's, at the time it was being used as administration buildings of some kind. Just one one thing that's district. important to note is this middle range of affordable units. So this is the option we're currently developing that has uh -huh. these land of uh -huh. affordabilities from 90 AMI down. Uh -huh. The 70 and 90 is in a range that most teachers in San Francisco, based on teacher salaries, 
would qualify for one of these. So there is uh -huh. some, there are some units that would qualify. Unfortunately, they don't get preferential <laughs> treatment to yeah. any other yeah. person making that range of income. They all have yeah. to go through the lottery system. Uh -huh. Marcus has a question, Brian. Um, yes. Can you get into the more meat and potato thing? Well, thank you for uh, getting this out. This is very helpful. I've got there many, many candidates that kind of are. Of your units that you're planning are ADA accessible? All of our units, all 299 units, are ADA accessible. Uh -huh. uh, I know you haven't covered it yet, you probably want to cover more. But I have questions. One of my areas of interest is what goes on underneath the building. And um, this morning at 12 15, I, was in, I just went to bed and my bed went like this. There's a 3.5 earthquake on the Hayward Fault this morning. I miss it. And wow. um, so that's one thing I'm interested in too, is what with groundwater rise and sea level rise, why is that affecting the soil underneath your building? Mm -hmm. And how far do you have to excavate or are you pile driving? Uh, so I actually provided some slides later to look at that specifically. So this is another very calm, uh, convoluted slide. There's a lot of information on here. But what I'll try and point out is a few things. So we are just in the early stages of working with our structural engineers and our geotechnical engineers. And I will be the first to admit I am not a geotechnical engineer or a structural engineer. I rely on people much smarter than me to tell me the best way to build this building. So what I can tell you about this site, and this is looking at ground level and where different soils below our building off. Our soil is actually a pretty good location. All of this yellow is very dense, dense soil that is solid for bearing and building of the size. Because of that, we don't anticipate needing piles running deep, but rather a thick mat slab. So very thick amounts of concrete rebar that lock it into that soil. These small green areas are old marsh soil strata, and we just need to make sure that our building doesn't stop in one of these areas. So right now we are exploring whether we have one basement, which would stop here above groundwater level, or a second basement, which would come below the marsh and be slightly below where the groundwater, and I, I believe the groundwater is right between here, right around where this marsh layer is. So that is what we're currently exploring in these details. What's, what's important to note is, is in the news of late with the Millennial Tower, that is known as one of the most heavy buildings ever built in San Francisco. Our building is a lot lighter to start with, and it's on a much stronger area of San Francisco soil. Um, and so we're still working through with our experts, but that's one of the one of the items we're suddenly exploring. Can you forward your geotech report for a minute? Uh, sure, yeah, yeah, we have that. Yeah, I do want to say something. Dense sand is actually really good. What they call compacted sand. Yeah, that sand is really good. I mean, uh, I was, there was a Lisbon had a massive earthquake in 1755. That city is a lot like San Francisco. The buildings that survived that earthquake from 1755 were all built on sand. Um, so the sand is really good. Our goal is to just stay out of the green parts. And and unlike <coughs> unlike the uh, Millennium Tower that's built near the bay. It's all marsh, bay mud. There's no sand there. So and that's the- It's built down there where it used to be bay at one time. Yep. A, exactly. It's yep. a very, very, very different environment. So, yeah, which, really, which is fortunate. Which is fortunate for us. So how much strain would, would, would your driving into the ground put on the park? We're not gonna drive it. We're not driving it. Or whatever, you, you, would just you building your building, how much strain would it put on an older building like a park? None, None whatsoever. In fact, we're going to we're going to shore up next to it. Mm -hmm. yep. So we're actually going to uh, structurally reinforce it. Um, yeah. And all the buildings along our side. We're going to structure the Quaker the house, the, the, the all the buildings around. It. But you're right. If we were driving, I was driving. Mm -hmm. You would put vibrations. Yeah. You would vibrate, and, and so we we've opted to go with less parking mm -hmm. and have a sh more shallow basement. That way we stay in the stables, compacted sand, have a more solid building and have less impact for neighbors.
we board that. Yeah, I'll be honest, we're fortunate we live in a city where you don't need a lot of parking uh, for the residents. Are your engineers and geotechnical looking into what happens if the groundwater there goes up three or four feet on that slab? Yeah.